Thank you so much for your love and uh, really, this is amazing body, amazing church. Well, I want to pray and I want to share. Father, just thank you for this church. Thank you for this body. Thank you for this Bible college. Bless this word and continue to reveal to us, Lord, who you are and who we are in you. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, if you have a Bible, if you have, a, if you have an iPad, iPhone, <laughs> I want to read from Matthew 13. I, I love the scene of the children here. You know, I, I, wanted, I wanted to use your imagination because in Matthew 13, we have the same scene. We have the disciple of Christ, and they're like little children, you know, around Christ. And they ask Christ a question, like, Jesus Christ, why do you speak in a certain tone or a certain language? Like, you are speaking in a way, and you already know that your speech is not going to be understood by everybody around you. And Christ gave an amazing answer. It goes along with the message we heard this morning from Pastor Scheller. It's about Revelation. In verse 11, he answered and said to them, Matthew 13, 11, he said to them, because it has been given to you to know the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven, but to them it has not been given. I mean, we are so honored by God. Like God gave us a revelation. And he says, like, it is given to you to, it is given to, you to know. And it's not given to them. We may ask the question, is God discriminating against people? The answer is no. But God has a condition. If you really want to know God, you have to believe that he exists and he actually manufactures everything in this universe and sent Christ to save you. So the condition to know God is to believe in him. And I thought about us believers here in Baltimore, and I thought about people, simple people in the city of Baltimore. And I said in my heart, there are three assumptions people can assume or can adapt in their lives will take them to like a, a, a very peace pla a peaceful place or a peaceful ground. Assumption number one, I'm a human being. I decided to believe in God. So it's very safe for me to assume that I do not know God outside of his revelation. That's a very safe. Like it doesn't take uh, theology or philosophy or a lot of knowledge. I can be a simple farmer, I can be a simple mechanic. I can just say in my heart, hey, I know I'm a believer in Christ. I know a little bit, but it's very safe for me to assume that I, I, do, not know out, I do not know God outside of his revelation. Assumption number two, if I cannot know God outside of his revelation or aside from his revelation, I am able to know the same God from his revelation, by the help of the Holy Spirit. Someone can say to me, but that takes education. And the answer, yeah, it takes education. And Jesus said to his disciples, and these people, they had no idea about the baton of faith that, were, that, was, that Christ was about to give them. Like they had no idea about this baton. All they knew that Christ said to them, it was given to you to, you to know certain things, a list of things. You know, they're huge. Like these things, they change the lives of others. They, they're going to change your life and the life of those who hear you. And like, and it's amazing because they had no idea. The last assumption that if, if I, do not go, I do not know God outside of the Bible and I'm able to know him from the Bible, the last assumption it is very healthy also for us as believers to assume and adapt in our lives that this knowledge comes to us through a process, and that process involves people, hum, other human beings. Pastor Shibley said it, we give our money to people, and that involves trust. I have to trust other people in the body of Christ, raised by God, to teach me about the very same God. Without that medium, human medium, it's not going to happen. And like four years and a half, I had amazing experience experience being in the Bible college, taught by men and also people in the body of Christ, 
that really taught me this Christianity is really real. You know, God can change our lives because there's something God gave us. This access to have knowledge of him, and this knowledge doesn't stop. It just continues on and on and on. The only condition is that I cooperate. I say to God, here I am. Like, I don't have to be a scientific, or a, a, like a, a, like a, into science, or I don't have to be a philosopher, I don't, have to be, I don't have to be a theologian. All I have just to come, I make myself available, and I say to Christ, you said it to me, Christ. It was given to me to know. Now I am available. Can you teach me? Can you reveal to me yourself? Can you reveal to me the Holy Spirit that's in me? And Jesus is so gracious to us, and he speaks to us, and he is so kind, and he knows that we have different capacities. Theology, knowledge, might not be an immediate answer for my problem. Uh, my car is broken. Uh, my relationships are broken. But I want to give God, like if I'm a human being, I have problems in my life, and I do, I would love to give God the chance to kind of have access to my heart and allow him to show me where is the real solution lies at. You know, without that cooperation, I'm going to continue to live in suffering. That's unnecessarily suffering, you know. But the good news in the body of Christ, we have seen and we, are, we have people around us that they have, gave, they have given God access into their lives and we can see their lives. It's not that they're perfect, but they're just allowing God to have that access. And they're allowing God to show them the things that were shown to them in their lives. And they have an amazing life, and they have the peace of mind, and they have this confidence and faith in God. I mean. Our next speaker, wasn't that amazing? Pastor, thank you, Mahib. Our next speaker is Pastor Jeff McKeon. He's faithfully serving in Dundalk. Let's welcome him. God bless you. Good evening. If you could turn with me to Proverbs chapter 22, I will pray. Father, in Jesus' name, let these words encourage us, edify us, deliver us, be a building block for what we'll hear from our pastor. In Jesus' name, amen. Proverbs 22, 28. Do not move the ancient landmark or boundaries which your fathers have set. And one more verse, Revelation chapter 2, 7a, the a part of verse 7. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. And I think there are five amazing boundaries or landmarks that our forefathers here at Greater Grace taught us that by God's grace we should never remove and I'm going to just list them and give a few verses. Number one, we have been taught here not to remove the boundary of not eating from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, but rather exchanging that tree for a tree of life. And that is where we eat. That is where we spend our time. Because God said, do not eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Man's whole problem is because they decided to eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Number two, the faithfulness of God. We will never remove the boundary that it is God's faithfulness. Habakkuk chapter 2 verse 4, Hebrews 10.38, Galatians 3.11, and Romans 1.17 says the same thing. It's the faithfulness of God. Mark 11.22, have faith in God. It is God's faithfulness. We can do what we can do all over the world and right here in Baltimore because we have set like a pillar on this boundary, this landmark, and we're not going to be moved. Didn't our founding pastor teach it? Don't these men of God teach that to us today? That it is the faithfulness of God. 
The flesh is profitable very little, actually nothing at all. Jesus has crucified the flesh. But the life that we now live, we live by faith of the Son of God. Isn't that amazing? Number three. This one is amazing, and it really touched me for the island of Haiti. Isaiah 28, 18. The covenant with hell has been broken. And we went to the island, and we heard that they made a covenant with Satan to get their freedom. And Pastor Cannon said, you know what, I think I'll go to the island and bring true freedom, the gospel of all grace. And by the way, that covenant is not going to stand. The Abrahamic covenant is going to stand. The Davidic covenant is going to stand. The covenant I made with Israel is going to stand. And to the Haitian people, you can have freedom through the blood of Jesus Christ and because of grace. The old covenant of hell has been broken. Number four, there is a spirit of the age, which is the spirit of Cain, that that Christians would like to bring the best of the garden to God and think it will be acceptable. But we have taught, been taught very well that it is the blood. It is only by the blood. Abel, when the animal was shed, applied the blood. The blood was on the doorpost. All of the books of the Bible are very bloody for a reason, because the covenant with hell has been broken, and it's because of the blood. And number five, the most amazing one, grace and no other gospel. No other gospel. Haiti, Baltimore, Dundalk, Massachusetts, anywhere you go in the world. It's grace and no other gospel. Paul said, I'd rather they be dedicated to destruction than preach another gospel. Galatians chapter 1, verse 6 through 8. And I'm so thankful that this ministry for 50 plus years has said, these are the pillars of the faith, these are the boundaries, and we're not going to be moved by God's grace. And one more thing, I heard a message from Pastor Stevens. I, I believe it was Corporate Pentecost. And he said, you know, we don't have to have like this false humility and say at the, like they were with Jesus and they all were going around, Lord, is it I? We can say because of grace and no other gospel, Lord, it's not going to be me. I will not be the one that dips my finger because of grace and my position in Christ. I'm so secure in my position that if I fall from it, I know I fall right back into more grace and it'll never take me out of grace. Isn't that amazing? Isn't that what we need? Covenant with hell broken, the blood and the word of God. In Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, thank you, Pastor Jeff. Power and passion right there. Uh, just for a moment, take your neighbor and have a moment of prayer. We have a, in particular, let's be praying for the convention coming and many great things that are, that we're praying for God's moving and for that revelation to be unveiled and lives changed. So just for a few minutes, just maybe take your neighbor and, and spend some time in prayer. Thank you.
Wouldn't it, wouldn't it be amazing for this summer? Wouldn't it be amazing if this summer somebody like Zacchaeus was in a tree and he wanted to know Christ and we were walking along the way this summer somewhere and we would say come down and we would talk with him and he would he would drink everlasting water wouldn't it be amazing that that would happen to us individually this summer Lord, please give us somebody like Zacchaeus in your name and many other things that you can do for us, many answers to prayer. Lord, you know our hearts. We are people of faith. Yes. And for your, your spirit to anoint us in the convention, in all of the various things that happen up to and then after, keeping us, you keep us. You bless us. Thank you. And for those that are in trials and troubles, poor, your, you said your grace is sufficient. It really is. It is sufficient. We want to believe that. Lord, yes, God. And for all the traveling to Peru, the high school, going to Peru tomorrow, and for all the traveling and all of the conferences and all of the the activities and here in New Jersey, we think of Southern New Jersey, we think of Western Maryland, Northern Virginia, and we think of the Eastern Shore and Southern Maryland and souls, Lord, we pray, thank you. And for this assembly tonight, thank you for every mother's daughter, every mother's son, Every child, every person here tonight, thank you in your name. Amen. Wouldn't it be amazing? Wouldn't it be awesome? Uh, turn, in your, turn in your Bibles to Luke 19. And we just uh, are encouraged by the brothers who shared tonight and all the young people up here tonight, that was so beautiful. And uh, the moms and dads, and Jolt's mom is here from Hungary, that's a big thing, that's awesome. And, uh, and some are getting ready to go back home, Andre will be going back to Moldova, and uh, the Finns will be going back to Finland, and uh, the anointing. How many of you remember how much we would speak in the ministry about the anointing? Uh, it was a often what we would say that was anointed ministry. That was an anointed message, an anointed song. Uh, that was an anointed word. We have the anointing of quietness that happens. Sometimes there is a holy hush that comes over the congregation. Uh, sometimes there is a broken anointing and there are tears and a pause and a, just a sense of the Holy Spirit saying, I care. I love you, I understand you, I sympathize with you. Uh, sometimes there is a, 
anointing of authority and even uh, a strong word of exhortation. And that happens in the ministry. We need it because it helps me in my will. You know, you don't reason with people all the time. You exhort them. You tell them, don't do that, don't do that. That's not wise. That's dangerous. Stop it. Stop it. Go ahead, you can say that. Stop it. Go ahead, say it. Stop it. Okay. <laughs> it's actually fun when the Holy Spirit is with you in it and you talk to yourself or to somebody in love with authority. We had visitors here from uh, Colorado and Arizona, and they're here for six weeks. Not tonight, but they were here this morning. And they said to Pastor Jason, we love the directness. Is that correct? They love the directness. And, and I, I, we absolutely, we love that. And the directness is a very important part. The tears, the identification, uh, sometimes there is an anointing of joy. And I feel that in our church, like we said this morning, we pray that, the God, that God would give to the church the spirit of wisdom. And one of the evidences of a church having wisdom is how much they love the Bible and how much it is speaking to them, maybe in a unique way, like the world doesn't understand how, how we find things in the Bible or how the Bible speaks personally. That's another anointing. Pastor Stevens called it the penetrating anointing, a teaching anointing where the Spirit is penetrating and counseling me and speaking to my heart. There is not a greater phenomena, phenomenon. I'm sorry, is that the, which one is the plural one? Phenomena, yes, yeah, plural. Okay, so thank you. Phenomenon. There's not a greater phenomenon in the whole world than, of course, the salvation of a person, but the fellowship of Christ in the body. And Christ has many faces. He is a lion. He is a lamb. He is a man. He is an ox. He is an eagle. Of course, in the human psychology, they talk about the four personality types of people, the choleric, phlegmatic, sanguine, and uh, what's the other one, the sanguine? Choleric. I'm sorry, because I can't hear, because I'm old now, okay? So I can't, I can't just, I can't get it, so it's all right. The four personality types, and we say, what kind of person was Jesus? He had many faces. And in the book of Revelation in heaven, there are seven eyes with the, cre with the beast, the living creature. And we know that God could look at you with tears, with, with fierceness, with great uh, guidance as a teacher, great patience, great firmness like a soldier. And in the body of Christ, I want to come to a place where I cannot predict what will be happening there. I believe there are many portions and many expressions and many gifts. It is why we are not wandering around the street tonight or surfing somewhere the internet or looking for a girlfriend or finding the best steak in Baltimore City, which isn't a bad idea, or going about doing this or doing that in some way where I have no real deep expression in my heart, no real food. And this rich little man climbed the tree. And this is verse 1. Jesus entered and passed through Jericho. 
We have been there. There is the old part, and then there's the new Jericho. There's the ruins of the old Jericho and the new Jericho, and there's a bus stop there. And uh, there's a city, and they're selling dates, and it's very interesting. And I was talking to some Arabs there, and they say, this city is cursed. And I say, why do you say that? They said, because the Bible says it. I said, oh boy, that's great to be taught by the natives. Ah, and he passed through Jericho. Behold, there was a man named Zacchaeus. And we saw the trees there. Our tour guide showed us maybe it was one of these, and we had a talk, and this kind of tree, and so on, which was the chief among the publicans, and he was rich. And this is all I want to say tonight. I want you and me in our summer to be thinking uh, outside the box. I want you to be thinking, I don't know where it will happen. I do not when it will, when, know when it will happen. I don't know exactly how it will happen. But I want one of these guys this summer in my life. I want them. I, maybe they're in a Panera Bread parking lot. Maybe they're in a waiting room in a hospital. Maybe they're the state trooper that pulls you over. I don't know. But I believe that this story is written here for us. And I believe that you and I, because we are healthy, like we said this morning, and that message, I loved it because I love the body and I love that we have a free course in the Word. And we're not artificial and we're not pretending and we can say, I have sinned and I am a sinner and I have a sin nature. And that sin nature is like a monster. We said this morning that he's like a big dinosaur called Leviathan. And we said if he had a very good vocabulary, we would call that dinosaur a thesaurus. <laughs> and that was a joke. <laughs> In that dinosaur, you cannot put a leash on him and control him. I think of the drug addicts in Baltimore City, and there are many of them. And also the, uh, uh, the hard life of sin and the, the emptiness of the human heart, and also uh, the poor people that are going and, and uh, living a life, and they're kind of trapped. Uh, sometimes they're in a trailer park, and I read an article in the World Magazine this month's edition of this young guy that was in a, in a seminary, and he would go to the trailer park where the poor people were. It was very dilapidated. There was a picture of him under a tree preaching in the trailer park. And the poor people, nobody came for weeks, but he just persisted, and they started coming. Drugs, poverty, addictions, and he just kept preaching. And it stirred my heart, and I prayed for that guy, and I love that guy and what he's doing, and I love the attitude that he has. And so many people here have that attitude also. But I also want to say to the new believers, learn to be a soul winner. Learn to share your faith. If you turn to Acts 9, you see what happened to Paul when he became a believer. And it says in verse 19, when he re received food, he was strengthened and was saw certain days with the disciples which were at Damascus. And straightway he preached Christ in the synagogues that he is the Son of God. Verse 20. Pharisee becomes a believer. I just stay at home, not tell anybody. I'm a quiet believer. But Paul went right away and he preached Christ in the synagogue. Um, you become a believer and you, you hang out with the people 
that are saying in their hearts, Lord, open my mouth that I could speak as I ought to. Lord, open my mouth in the laundromat. And I do not mean just like evangelizing in a mechanical way, but I mean sitting with somebody in a laundromat and just sitting down next to them and caring about them, listening to them, studying them. Like be a people watcher and go somewhere where there are people and watch them and look at them and study them and think about them and become a communicator of deep things. Listen to them. I know Jesus. Oh, yeah, I know. I go to church and so on. And you just say, really? Okay. What? Tell me something about Jesus. One sentence. Tell me something. And they talk and talk and Wait a minute, tell me something, one thing, about Jesus. And they talk this way and they talk that way. You go back, tell me one thing about Jesus. Who is he? What has he done for you? Uh, people, there are some people that are dying to meet somebody like you. They want to know. Is there anything in your life that is really you have you are passionate about? Do you have any passion in your heart about the fact that you are believing in God and God has taken your sin away? That God has visited you in your prayer meeting or answered a prayer, or God has shown you something from the Word? Or that you're, you are able to talk or counsel or sit or discuss or listen or care or pray and say, may I tell you one thing that, may I tell you that I had a prayer answer and I believe that God can answer prayer for you? Do you can I share with you something that meant a lot to me? That I used to be, I have done this and I have done that and then God took it away? that he took it away. I don't know why Zacchaeus wanted to see Jesus, but he did, verse 3. He sought to see Jesus, who he was. And he could not for the press because he was little of stature. You think of little rich people. Wow. That's like a profile, right? Little rich guy knows how to get things done. He's there, like jumping up, like trying to see over the crowd, and he cannot. But he knows how, if he wants it, he knows how to find it. And he goes in verse 4. He ran before climbed up into a sycamore tree to see him, for he was to pass that way. He kind of knew, like, like Jesus is going this way, I, he could figure it out. I'll go there, I'll go up in that tree, I will see him. I want to meet somebody like this, this summer. I do. Imagine if everybody in our church was able to bring one person a year into the church. If everybody here had a Zacchaeus experience with somebody that is really out there, and you can go past them because they're not in the group. They might live across the street, or be out in the parking lot, and you walk past them. They might be at the gas stations over here. I spoke Hindi to one guy in a gas station over here. He looked at me with these big eyes, with a big smile, and he was shocked. And I don't know the, the language. I made it up. <laughs> and I go, I go to that church over there. 
That's an amazing church. Who is climbing up into a tree to see? Who is Jesus? Oh, there are a lot of people. They go, they're with the crowd. And a lot of the country, they don't know who Jesus is, but they know there's a lot, there's a big crowd around him. They know there are meetings and Bible readers and Bible books and Bible movies, but they do not know who Jesus is. Because it's impossible to know him unless the Holy Spirit shows him to you. And this is why we love each other so much. I know that you know. You know that I know. We know that we know. We're having a convention and it'll be on that level. It will not be the hype of a big crowd. It'll be the still, small voice of the anointing. It'll reach way back into the corners of the church, way deep into the heart of a teenager or a young college student or an elderly person. It'll minister to us. And we'll go home rejoicing and saying, Oh, I, I love it. Just like Zacchaeus, when Jesus said, come down, it's kind of like, I see you. You're going to be very happy by the end of this day because I know everything about you. I know everything in your heart. I know how hungry you are. I know I can feed you. I know that I have made you in my image. I am the one that will satisfy you deeply. And when at the end of the day, when you say, I am a Christian, people go, uh -huh. oh, another one. <laughs> Bible thumping, legalistic, you know, controlling, manipulative, right wing, narrow minded. And Zacchaeus would be going, I don't know what you're talking about. I just had lunch with Christ, Christ told me everything. Christ met my need. Christ set me free. I don't know what you're talking about. The stereotype of the Christian life by a liberal-minded, opinionated type of person or whatever we want to call or by anybody, ourselves included, is very possible we, will, we miss him. And we would be doing it tonight. Except we are anointed of God. That's not legalism. That is a love in the heart for righteousness. That's not a bondage. We don't have control over the dinosaur of our sin nature. But we sit back and we say, God's got it under control. He was crucified with Christ. And now I am free and I can feel it and sense my freedom. And oh, I wish that everybody in this world had that kind of freedom that Christ gives to whoever believes. Uh, it's amazing to hear Pastor Shabelli's testimony that once he was addicted to drugs, now no more. Of course not. <laughs> I began to doubt for a moment. No, of course not. Isn't that amazing? How many men, how many women, how many of us have been in bondage to some dinosaur of a type and we could not put him in a cage, we could not put a hook through his mouth, we could not have him on a leash, we could not speak kind words to him, we could not counsel him. I could not counsel my sin nature and change him. He is a beast and he will devour my life. The only answer is death. Let's read this in verse 5. When Jesus came to the place, he looked up and saw him and said unto him, Zacchaeus. What a great word. The name Zacchaeus. He knew his name. He knows your name. 
years ago when I read that verse in John 10, he calls me by name. I was thinking, I don't know that he, I never heard him, I've never really heard him talk to me. And I mean, has he called me by my name? You know, have you ever had that thought? Zacchaeus, Tom, your name, put it there. It's true. He calls you by name. When a bird falls out of a tree, it's done. God knows God is there. When a hair falls out of your head, God knows God is there. And God cares. He calls Zacchaeus and he says, hurry up, come down, for today I must abide at your house. I wonder how relaxed Jesus was in the house. I wonder how free he was, how, much, how many cups of tea or uh, drinks of water, or whatever. I wonder how they ate. I wonder how Jesus' posture was when he sat in the chair. I wonder how he was when he made a joke, when he talked to Zacchaeus, and then when he tuned it, when he just looked at him in the face and he talked to Zacchaeus and he took an hour or two or three or four hours and he is there with a man that needed it, that he needed Christ and he knew it. Or maybe he didn't know it, but now he knows it. And he's saying, at the end of it here, verse 6, uh, he made haste, came down, received him joyfully. When they saw it, they all murmured, saying that he was gone to be guest with the man that is a sinner. Zacchaeus stood and said unto the Lord, Behold, Lord, the half of my goods I give to the poor. If I've taken anything from any man by false accusation, I restore him fourfold. And Jesus said unto him, This day is salvation come to this house, for as much as he also is a son of Abraham. For the Son of Man is come to seek. Please ask God to put it in your heart to be a seeker, because Jesus is a seeker. It'll change your life when you become a seeker. When you kind of wake up to the world around you and you say, maybe, maybe there is somebody here. Maybe they're on the street corner. Maybe they're in a coffee shop. I don't know. Maybe they're on the phone. They're doing uh, that, uh, what do you call that on the telephone? Telemarketing. You know, sometimes I just have gone right into the telemarketer. And the guy adds up and goes, this is the greatest call I've had all day. Because you really lo lo can love them up and just say, just encourage them and then share Christ with them. You do not know. I just want to believe there are Zacchaeuses all over. I want to believe it. I, I don't know how, how it works, but the Son of Man came to seek. We, this is the message. You are healthy. You are anointed. You have a message. You're going to meet Christ soon. Be a soul winner. You're going to meet God face to face. You're going to give an account for all the time, all the opportunities, and every thought of your heart. Why not put this in your heart and say, God, did you put that in there so that I would realize that there are guys in the trees and on the telephone poles and up in the, and on the telephones and they are in the buses and they are all around us. They are little kids and older people and they are all kinds of people and that you put this here to say to me that you came to seek. Make me a seeker. Maybe it'll keep me from a foolish thing this summer. A weird, crazy idea that I have that leads me into deeper trouble. Make me a seeker and a soul winner. A counselor. If you don't like the word soul winner, and I know you do, you like it, I mean we all do, but I, at the same time there are barriers that people have about soul winning. Just drop the phrase. Be a talker. <laughs> be a storyteller. Be a news communicator. 
Be a, be a fun-loving helper of others' joy. When you're standing in line in the bank, what could I do to help the joy of these people? Have a lighter day. Could I tell a joke about a dinosaur who knows a lot of words? <laughs> or how do you make holy water? You boil the hell out of it. <laughs> hey, that guy's funny. And you have the, the communication. You have a, a story. You have a joke. You have a message. And then you got the reality. Is there something in your heart you are looking for? Let me tell you where there is a great church. Let me tell you where you can listen to great singing. You can have prayer. People, can, people have prayer before God. People come and sit with me. I'll meet you outside, and I'll, bring, I'll sit next to you. Come, let us fill our church with people. God wants the church to be filled. And if every one of us this summer will meet a Zacchaeus, one family here, met one of our people in the ocean surf. Was it at Ocean City or Bethany Beach? One of our people was in the surf, and they came up out of the water, and there were two people there, and they said, you know, do you believe in God? <laughs> and, and, and their family lives in, lives in Glen Burnie, and they come here every Sunday morning, and they'll tell you the story. We met some greater grace person in the ocean, and they came up out of the surf saying, Hey, do you believe in God? I don't believe I need to be like that, but that would be fun, actually, and God is in that. But at the same time, what about being quiet, kind, loving, direct? What about praying about it? I don't think we don't have to have a super alpha male personality and ambition. No, we, just, we can just be who we are in God and we can just say we are on a mission. I, I ask you, Lord, to make, to send us into the highways and byways on a mission. Let's knock on the door and bring them. Let's lovingly meet them and pray for them. And this is what happened in this story. The man was never the same. Never the same. Amen. Would you pray with me, please? That message was a barn burner right there. <laughs> it was. Well, it was from the Lord. That's what I believe, that message. Would you pray with me? Father, this is your work. And we are asking that we could be on a Saturday morning meeting together and going out. And this is our, our summer time, maybe a Friday night meeting with some brother or sister and going out somewhere to seek and love and invest. It, it, it is such a joy when Christ met the woman at the well and he said, I have met that deed that you do not know of. And he was so refreshed by that conversation with that woman. And this is also for us. Lord, this is your work. We ask you to lead us in it. We pray. And then if you are on the internet or here in the auditorium and you do not have Christ in your life, would you just say to Jesus, 
I believe in you. I trust in you. Fill me with your spirit. Show me who you are and save me tonight. By your grace, I pray. Would you raise your hand in the auditorium? Anyone at all? Raise your hand. Anyone at all? Raise your hand. You know, I have to, we have to say amen. I have, we have to say this, this thought with all of you tonight. Maybe at one time you were a soul winner. Maybe at one time it was part of your life. You shared your faith. And over the last maybe months or even years, you stopped doing it. And, um, and we, we want to say uh, just very lovingly, uh, that's an indication to me when that ha if that was to happen in my heart. That, that's an indication to me there's something not right in my heart. If I don't care about the lost, how do I know God? If God is love, that God loves Zacchaeus, why wouldn't he stop and talk to Zacchaeus? And if I cannot stop, maybe I am too busy. If I cannot stop, maybe I am not alert to the plan of God. If I cannot stop and say, Zacchaeus, it's your day today. I cannot stop and spend time with somebody that is hurting, that is needy, that is seeking, that is searching. Imagine somebody right away, I want God, and there's nobody there to tell them. I want God. Where is God? Actually, it happened in Poland. Pastor Mariusz was walking down the street. Roger Stanger, Pastor Roger Stanger, went out the door and he walked down the street. He stopped the man. Pastor Mariusz was his name, a student at the university. Roger said to him, what are you doing? And he said, I am seeking for God, quote, unquote. I am seeking for God. Roger goes, Wow. Amazing. That's why I am here, to tell you about God. Amazing. If I lose that, if I don't care, if I don't believe there could be a divine appointment, if I don't believe that God would answer my prayer, if I don't believe that I could open my mouth and have somebody there that is just waiting to hear from me, that I'm not right with God. There's something missing in my life. And I might be a good man, I might be a good Christian guy and moral guy and all that, and I might be very careful about living in a, in a good way, but come on, you're not made just to just be a good person, you're made to be a messenger with a message, an ambassador in bonds. Open my mouth that I would make known the mysteries of Christ, that I could share my heart, in my life, in my understanding with people that are hungry for it. You know, in Hungary, years ago, we, they, these young girls, two, Hoogie and Hagi, you can remember because they have like a, Hoogie and Hagi, those are funny names for us. Hoogie and Hagi, honestly, they, they heard the message, they were like 15 years old at the time, young girls, they heard the message, they came by bus where we were living, and they slept under a tree. Early that morning, they were there to meet us when we went out the door. And I said, what are you doing? And they said, we, are, we just had to see. We had to see you again. We had to come out here. We had to meet you. What? Why? Now, we are more than 20 years later, and they are very solidly in the church. Where did that hunger come from? It came from God. Who sent us? God sent us. How were we prepared by living in Baltimore and just learning on the streets of Baltimore how to share our faith? Now we are in Hungary. How could I be a missionary abroad if I'm not a missionary here? How can I be a pastor if I don't care about the Zacchaeuses in the tree and the woman at the well? How could I be an effective guy if I don't go straight away to the synagogue and preach Christ like Paul did and find himself in a lot of trouble like the Afghani pastor passed to Obed? And they said, they're, they're going to kill you. He said, I don't care. I grew up with that. 
I grew up killing and be, seeing people killed in, and killing people. He grew up in that, in Afghanistan, when he was 17 years old, with an AK-47. They threatened me, I don't care. I was, that's, that's like life for me. I never had my blood run as cold as it did when I listened to his, his stories. But at the same time, it was very refreshing to me to think of the words of Jesus. Do not care if they can kill your body. And he meant it. It doesn't matter if they can kill your body. We're not even facing anything like that in our country. But let's get, a, get our life in focus. Are you afraid of your reputation? Are you afraid of your neighbors? Are you afraid that you're going to be labeled as a crazy person? Are you afraid of what people are going to say about you or think about you? Are you shy, timid? Are you withdrawn? Are you afraid of people? The fear of man is a snare. It, it, they, Zacchaeus is crying out, could somebody talk to me? I mean, I want to meet Jesus. I am hungry for Jesus Christ, the real Jesus. And I believe you people, and we are being prepared by God in this room and in this ministry so that we have something to say. We'll say it in the bowling alley. We'll say it at Panera Bread. We'll say it in the parking lot in front of Sam's Club. We'll say it uh, at night, we'll say it in the morning, we'll say it in wisdom, we'll say it at the barbecue, we'll say it at the party, we'll say it at the bedside of a dying man. One time we were in Finland at a nursing home and uh, this man contacted us. He was dying in some hours and he heard there were missionaries and he sent for us and two went. And they talked to him, prayed with him and he did die right there. But he heard the message, had tears going down his eyes, heard the message of Christ, and he got saved. And that's a beautiful story. You and I are prepared to give and bring a message in a dark world. And brother and sister, regardless of what people are saying and how many crosses are on steeples and how many churches are around, there is a famine in the land. Many people do not know him. Many people do not have a message. Many people don't know what to say. Many people that went to church this morning will be silent tomorrow. And they'll be silent all week. And they'll say at their working place very little about it. But we want to say to the Lord, help us, God. And open our mouths. And that's it. Amen. Stand.